to reach the United States and from there with new luck, maybe Canada. Um, we 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 are seeing also the 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 incredible pressure and stress in Haiti. Um, when I speak about insecurity, um, kidnapping is 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 plaguing the country. Um, it, you know. Um, narco traffickers and are, 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 are have taken you know uh, criminal organizations have taken control of ju the capital i know that when i speak with 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 friends uh in in haiti and and also family members uh this is the situation they are in right now and and uh and it's a, a daily a daily stress for them mm. not knowing uh, you know who will be the next uh, uh, who will be gone down? Who will be kidnapped? It's uh, it's the, and and Cora is back, and and uh, and uh, you have a humanitarian crisis uh, that is that is uh, also you know uh, happening right now, and uh, and it's total despair. It's total despair. So we cannot be indifferent, and we have to recognize that uh, we have also. Uh, when I say we, I mean Canada, uh, you know, uh, participated in the situation Haiti is in now. Um, and when I say that, uh, you know, think about how the Canadian and American governments in their decisions to deport small-scale traffickers of Haitian origin to Port-au-Prince without even consulting the country's authorities. They've been doing that for, for, for years thus dumping an insurmountable plague of, uh, on the weak nation. These deportees who were obviously not prosecuted with the strength of their networks quickly anchored you know, their criminal activities on Haitian soil and, and swelled the ranks of the drug trafficking uh, you know, network and activities and nebula you know, in, in Haiti. And we know that this problem is continental um, and that the Republic of Haiti will not be able to deal with it alone. Uh, so, so that's why I'm saying the responsibility must be shared between all the international protagonists of this drama, uh, and it takes a true, you know, collaborative exercise, uh, as I was saying, of truth and accountability uh, in a concerted and orderly manner. And so, in the in the face of that, what specifically would you want wealthy nations like this one, like Canada, to do? You know. Um, I would say that the sovereignty of Haiti has been so often flouted that it is uh, in tears. Um, following the assassination of President Moise, uh, foreign ambassadors, in con including you know the ambassador of Canada, with the consent of their capital, of, so then it was consent also of o Ottawa and and the participation of the United States, proceeded without restraint to install you know Prime Minister Ariel Henry and the de facto government currently in power in Haiti. This is. This is, a, you know, a rare situation in contemporary history, and we are we are witnessing an absolute, you know, uh, a fail failure of multilateralism, and this happened without consideration for for a beleaguered population that has been demanding for years respect for the rule of law and for the mobilization of hundreds of Haitian civil society organizations concerned with a return to constitutional order. So, so um, in order to, to uh, and, and, and I believe that um, um, it's, it's, it's important, you know, for, for, for Canada, for example, to to recognize the importance of considering the the efforts of Haitian civil society mm. uh, in 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 finding you know a, a Haitian solution to uh, to to the problem to, to the crisis right now. Let me let me let me just ask you specifically about that because we spoke with Monique Kleska who lives in Port-au-Prince. She's a member of the Commission for mm -hmm. a Haitian Solution to the Crisis. Take a listen to what she told us last year. I don't think it's Canada's role to stop the violence right now. And I think that's the kind of reversal that we want. It is Haitian society. It is Haitian government that must be a sovereign state 
so that we have a new political direction and then we can say to others, to our friends like Canada and the United States and the UN, this is the kind of help we need. This is the kind of support we want you to provide. Of course, we know that we cannot do it alone, but it is not up to them to decide what we need, what form of government we should have, when we should have elections, who should be directing the country. This is not the role of the international community. So the Prime Minister has said that Ottawa will only act when there is political consensus of Haitians mm -hmm. to support that act. Let me go back to the question that I asked you, and, and, and I guess help us understand how you work that out, ensuring that Haitians create their own solutions, but also solutions that will require, in many ways, the support of the international community. How is that possible? Okay, I, I believe that, you know, um, the de facto prime minister uh, that has been put in place by, uh, you know, the group of ambassadors uh, with the consent of the nation, you know, after the assassination of, of uh, President Jovenel Moïse, uh, has recently reached an agreement with part of civil society to, to, to create a high council of transition and an and organ of control of government action. And what we can hope for, as Monique was saying, you know, uh, from from a Haitian uh, solution to the crisis, that we, uh, this with this agreement, uh, it will, uh, you know, hopefully lead to an inclusive societal alliance. You know, something like a consensual approach to transitional governance, a pro pro proposition, a pro propositional force driven by Haitians themselves with the ultimate goal of the nation's best interest uh, and, and the common good. So, because Haiti needs a roadmap mm. that will allow um, to, to get to the, the, the most pressing issues, that is to eradicate the armed gangs that control the capital and paralyze the country. And for this, Haiti un undeniably needs solid reinforcements, inspired by what other countries on the continent and elsewhere in the world have implemented in similar circumstances. So, so uh, what is needed is inclusive, robust and representative governance for sure, well structured to establish the terms of reference of international cooperation in solidarity with Haiti. Let me ask, you, well, let me ask you about the reinforcements because the, the security on the ground, to your point, is paramount. People don't know who is going to be kidnapped next. We know exactly. U.S. President Joe Biden and the Prime Minister uh, Trudeau are going to hold a bilateral meeting today. Joe Biden will reportedly press Canada to lead an international security force in Haiti that would support Haiti's national police force, presumably to deal with the violence that you're seeing right now. Is that something that you would support? Okay, when we say support the Haitian national police, I think it's more than support. There's this, you know, there's an urgent supervision of Haitian national police that is needed because unfortunately very much, I mean, the police is very much infiltrated by criminals. So we have to be very, very careful in how we're doing this. And likewise, you know, for the control, I think what the kind of support that we can we can bring, because we've done that, we've done that. I remember that after the earthquake, how much, you know, the RCMP and some provincial police forces went down to Haiti to actually, you know, train even and, and support the Haitian National Police. Um, and, 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 and this is right now, more than support that is needed is supervision because as i said the police is largely infiltrated by criminals so so, like so would you so would you support a canadian led international security force in haiti it doesn't, you know, I, I don't think Haitians want, want to see boots on the ground. Yeah. That's, okay? I think what they want is something like a structured, you know, support uh, with, with uh, know-how, likewise for the control of port activities in order to effectively fight against weapons, trafficking, and movement, mainly from the United States. Um, because they, they, they help Haitian, help, help, you know, the, the Haitian trans transitional government to to see at uh, you know the the economy of insecurity that is really flourishing and its beneficiaries uh, uh, resisting also uh, uh, to to all the changes that are required to reclaim and secure the national territory and and for that there are 
terms of reference that that sh that should be you know um, put in place, uh, including a strategy to des design to respond you know to the Calcora and humanitarian crisis. I think Canada can do that. I think I think and not just Canada alone. It's like bringing some support that is that doesn't have to be like a military presence doesn't have to be like forces uh, foreign forces on the ground but assistance i don't know if i'm being clear on that well no i, I think part of it is that people are trying to figure out and it, this will depend in many ways on consensus within haiti to 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 get to a point where the country itself um is in agreement in terms of what it is looking for from the international community and this is something that, that we've talked about with, with Haitians, that we've talked about with international observers as well. Bob Ray uh, was on this program uh, last month. He is the ambassador to the United Nations. He was in Haiti in early December. Have a listen to some of what he said is needed to help Haiti get past that political impasse that we've been talking about. What we haven't got yet, and we're still waiting for it and need to see it, is Haitian political leaders of all stripes, from civil society, the Montana group, plus other political parties getting together and say, okay, we want to have a transition to uh, an election. We need to have state institutions established for a period of time so that we can then move forward on uh, uh, having an election so that the government can have legitimacy and then the state can rebuild itself with the assistance of outside countries. Mikhail Jean, how likely is it that we will see that sort of political organization, that sort of political consensus in Haiti anytime we're hoping, soon? We're, we're hoping that the agreement that has been reached recent, just, just you know, uh, a, a few weeks ago uh, with uh, de facto Prime Minister Ariel Henry and part of civil society, creating a high council of transition, uh, an organ of control of government, uh, will lead to an inclusive societal alliance. That's what I, what I was saying. Consensual approach to transitional governments. Uh, a a pro propositional force driven by Haitians themselves with the ultimate goal of the nation's best interest and the common good. This is what is needed. And and then, and, and we need also, uh, I say, when I say we, I, I would say, uh, Haiti and, and and Haiti's friends need to see an inclusive, robust and representative you know, governance, well structured to establish also the terms of reference of international cooperation mm. in solidarity with Haiti. And and, and, and if only, you know, um, I, 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 and I, I say that again, um, a well structured, you know, uh, urgent supervision of the Haitian National Police because we can be there, you know, supporting the National Police, um, giving more equipment to the National Police, but we have to see what they're doing with it because there is indeed, you know, uh, like uh, an economy of insecurity uh, uh, that is flourishing. But we know that some, 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 some members of the police force are selling also arms that they are receiving, are using for their own, you know, uh, interest, you know, equipment that is given to them. So it has to be well supervised with uh, the Haitian, you know, a transitional government uh, and, 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 and of course, um, there's, there's one thing that we need to understand. We didn't pay attention to what the civil society in Haiti has been, you know, mobile, how it, it has been mobilizing and, and how, they, how they've been working, you know, to find, you know, Haitian solution to this Haitian uh, problem. Um, you know, and experiences have elsewhere have demonstrated that uh, it is through the strengthening of civil resistance and, and support for citizen initiatives and actions that that uh, are fundamentally non-violent that peace and security can can be built um, with the essential contribution of the people. So ignoring what the people are are, are, are saying, ignoring the fact that, that you know, for too long, for more than a year now, um, the, the the de facto prime minister and his government have not be, been really trying hard enough, you know to engage in something, in some form of 
transitional, you know, uh, governance that is inclusive. So, so, so this is what also because when I hear um, Ambassador Bob Ray, whom I, I respect, mm. of course, only speaking about you know um, having a, a dialogue with political forces in Haiti, I, I I would say not just them, but also, and I know that Bob Ray when he went to uh, to to Haiti, right. he took the time to speak to representatives of civil society like Monique Kiska and others, you know, uh, to to make sure that. Canada could, could come with with a strategy along Haitians, you know, uh, that in, that is inclusive. We're, we're, we're almost out of time. We just have a minute or so left. And I know that you have deep affection for this country, but you've also said that history will not be kind to those who remain active. Just very briefly, what are you most concerned about? I mean, what, 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 is, what is your greatest fear? I think that right now, um, my greatest fear is is for us to see um, more people dying already. Like hundreds and thousands of people have died. Uh, with with um, I mean the, the criminal organizations who have received full impunity for so long and who have grown now more organized, taking con control of of, of 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 the capital. This country is really at highest at the highest risk right now. We cannot remain indifferent. Mm -hmm. We have to come along, you know, and, and 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 in solidarity with Haiti, but in a different way. Not just uh, you know uh, deciding for Haitians, but supporting, you know, the transitional process and being there in a very uh, organized and and um, and I would say concerted way. Mm. Uh, this is this is what what we need to do right now because otherwise um, we will continue to to see this country as being cursed. This country is also uh, a place where you have intelligent people, right. people with goodwill, and and these are the people that need to be supported. And I think even you know mm. um, with with the, this terms of reference of solidarity. And, and 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 assistance we'll see also um uh, we, we will support also, um, you know, the, the electoral right. process in Haiti, and 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 we'll see the, the country going back, you know, to a, to a democratic and constitutional order. We'll leave it there, Mikhail Jean. Good to speak with you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mikhail Jean, former Governor General of Canada, served as UNESCO's special envoy to support reconstruction efforts in Haiti. Talking about what she wants from the Canadian government to support that country. This is the current. We're back in six minutes. Stay with us. This is CBC Radio 1, 103.7 FM in Grand Manan. Son of a Crypt is back, and things are changing in young Mark's personal life. You're becoming a man now. Some interesting girls, hair popping up everywhere, is school life. Sister Margaret is dead, and in her place we have Ms. Fowler. His love life. You don't even know she got a boyfriend. And, well, the rest of his life. Season 2 of Son of a Critch, Tuesdays at 8.30 on CBC. Stream free on CBC Gem. The CBC News is next. Coming up in an hour, it's Q. Dakota Ray Hubert decided she wanted to make her debut comedy album all about the Indian Act. So Dakota will be here to tell you how she wants to use comedy to speak her own truth as an Indigenous person and why she wanted to record her album Steps Away from Parliament Hill in Ottawa. This is the CBC News for New Brunswick. It's 9 o'clock. I'm Sarah Trainer. European Union climate researchers are saying the world is not ready for climate change related extreme weather. And that's a problem as the latest EU data continues to show how rapidly the earth is warming. Inayat Singh has more. The last eight years have been the warmest eight years on record. 
Last year, we said that the last seven years have been the seven most warmest years on record. Samantha Burgess is part of the European Union's Earth Observation Scientific Program. 2022 was the fifth warmest year on record, but crucially, that happened during La Nina, a periodic global atmospheric phenomenon that generally lowers global temperatures. If we remove that La Nina from 2022, then the temperature would have been even warmer than we observed. A hot Hotter 2023 could bring with it worse climate disasters like the storms moving into California and the floods in Canada last year, highlighting the urgency for communities to start preparing. In Ayat Singh, CBC News, Toronto. It has gone from bad to worse across a vast area of California, with the state now getting hit by a second straight powerful storm system. Steve Futterman has the latest. Overnight, once again, California was battered by strong winds and very heavy rains. I've been here 28 years, and this is the most water we've seen in 28 years. This is what it sounded like as the latest storm gave California exactly what it doesn't need right now. In many areas, it was just too much rain. The entire community of Montecito is ordered evacuated and evacuated now. In the exclusive city of Montecito, north of L.A., where a deadly mudslide killed 23 people in 2018, residents were told to leave. Nearby in Ventura, California, flash floods trapped a number of people. The forecast calls for more rain the rest of the week. How much more rain hillsides already saturated can handle? Officials don't really know. Steve Futterman for CBC News, Los Angeles. Tens of thousands of people across Brazil want the world to know they do not support former President Jair Bolsonaro. Oh, 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 In the wake of pro-Bolsonaro supporters storming the Brazilian Capitol buildings over the weekend, pro-democracy pro protesters took to the streets yesterday in cities and towns across the country. Many were wearing red. It's the color of the Workers' Party, which is led by newly elected President Luiz Inacio Lula da Silva. At the same time, the former president has been admitted to hospital in Florida. Bolsonaro's wife says he is experiencing intestinal pain related to an attack five years ago in which Bolsonaro was stabbed. The MLA for Bathurst West Beresford says he is a bit concerned about the environmental risk at the Caribou Mine site. Rene Legacy's comments come after word the province will make sure security and pumping systems keep working there, at least in the short term, as Trevally Mining goes out of business. Legacy says his concerns stem from word that the Environment Department has not had much presence on site since the zinc, copper, lead, silver and gold mine shut down last summer. I mean, we all knew, we knew where Trevally was going to end up and probably we're going to close and, and as it gets closer to the end, you'd think that the risk is going to be higher. So I would have anticipated that the environmental department would have stepped up their presence and not answered, we haven't been there in a while. Legacy says he's hopeful a new operator for the mine can be found, and if not, a larger investment may be needed to secure it for the long term. And that's the CBC News for New Brunswick. CBC meteorologist Tina Simkin. Periods of snow throughout the day today, accumulating anywhere from a trace to two centimeters in the west and two to perhaps up to five centimeters in the east. Winds today will pick up out of the northwest, 20 at times gusting up to 40 kilometers per hour, with temperatures ranging between minus six and minus one. Overnight tonight, skies begin to clear from west to east, a few flurries staying in the forecast and temperatures dropping near minus 20 in the north, minus seven in the south. Good morning, I'm Matt Galloway, and you're listening to The Current. Still to come, an attack on the capital, this time in Brazil. But first, another story of a Canadian doing extraordinary work from finding his calling as a child, learning about the Holocaust, to educating generations about anti-Semitism. Well, to kick off 
the new year, we have been sharing some of the stories of the new additions to the Order of Canada. We've heard from scientists, volunteers, musicians, teachers. And we'll get to the teachers part in just a moment. Um, it's been fascinating learning about Canadians and the work that they are doing. Ellie Rubenstein is the religious leader of the Congregation Habanim and longtime national director of the March of the Living. He is receiving the Order of Canada for his significant contributions to Holocaust education. Ellie Rubenstein, good morning. Good morning, Matt. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very much appreciated. What is and, this? And well, what does this recognition mean to you? Well, to be quite frank, when I got the phone call from the wonderful woman at the, at the Governor General's office, my first reaction was, are you sure you have the right number? <laughs> to which she laughed. And uh, I, I was completely um, um, surprised, shocked, uh, did not see it coming. I had no idea this was being planned, that people were lobbying behind the scenes for this and, and making, you know, making all sorts of beautiful things about me. And so I was completely taken aback by it. But then I, I grew from that, that surprise and not, really not feeling I was worthy of it, and, and I'm still wondering if I am, to incredible appreciation because I was not expecting the deluge, the flood of phone calls and emails and texts and, and just incredible appreciation and joy and vicarious pleasure that so many of my friends um, expressed to me. And that, that for me was, the Order of Canada is a beautiful award, but the, the love and the affection and, and the, just the, the genuine good feelings I got from so many people completely took me by shock and, and I think for me what I thought about was when I got the award that there's so many, many other Canadians who are doing incredible work and deserve accolades if not as much even more than I and if you're listening to this you know such people give them a call give them a pat on the back and tell them how much they're appreciated because I know that they will appreciate that as well it's very generous of you let me talk about the good work that you have done that you're being recognized for uh, where where did the work in terms of Holocaust education begin for you? Well, I grew up in Toronto in um, um, a very religious community. Uh, my own mother was uh, a refugee from the Holocaust. Many of the family members perished. My grandfather came from a town in Poland. My mother's from Hungary. My grandfather came from a town in Poland. It was virtually wiped out during the Holocaust. Not a single Jew survived. He came in 1913, but anybody who didn't come before the war, almost nobody survived from that town. And I grew up in not only having Holocaust stories in my family, but also uh, my peers, all of, many of my friends, their parents were Holocaust survivors. My teachers, many of them were Holocaust survivors. I grew up seeing, as a matter of course, people with numbers in their arms, which was the numbers the Nazis um, put on prisoners in Auschwitz, branded them like cattle. And I grew up with that very, very um, sad part of human history as part of my consciousness. And it was something that really, really bothered me and troubled me because, you know, I was, ch I was a child. I wanted to love the world. I want, to, I want to appreciate the world. I want to see the beauty in the world. And then I was surrounded by, you know, examples of the exact opposite. So for my entire childhood, I was wondering, how could this have happened? How can we understand this? And how can we make sure it doesn't happen again, not to the, just to the Jewish people, but to any member of the human family? So I grew up with that shadow of the Holocaust throughout my entire childhood and, and, and adolescence. Part of the work that you do, um, as I mentioned in the introduction, is to take students from around the world with survivors to spend time in significant sites from the Holocaust, in Poland, in Germany. Why, why is it important to be in those places? Because education can happen in any different w number of ways. But when you're there, what's different about being there in terms of that educational process? You're absolutely right. Education can happen anywhere, and we should be encouraged to people to read books and to, to watch films and to listen to speakers about the Holocaust and all that's very good. But when you go back to a place like Auschwitz and you hear someone tell their story in the very place their tragedy unfolded, it leaves an indelible mark. I, I remember uh, Judy Weisinger Cohen, a beloved Holocaust survivor from Toronto, um, telling her story. I heard it many times. And... Uh, just a fragment of her story. She one time told 